Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorthy, and today I am joined by a very, very special space champion, Mr. Covey. Mr. Covey is the founder and the editor-in-chief of Fun Fact Science, where he champions the saying, don't believe it, understand it. Mr. Covey is a physics student and research assistant at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His team studies supernova at radio wavelengths and monitors other high-energy astronomical transients. Outside of his online science communication efforts, he volunteers for the Space IL and is a member of the Horizon Space Educators community. He works for the Roman uh, Foundation in the Space Lab program and taught in the Young Astronauts program as a part of the Hebrew Youth University. Wanting to go into law, Mr. Rose got into science and space in college, changing his direction, you know, considered relatively later. And I'm curious more about what changed his course of track and how he became so successful in such a short period of time. I'm so excited to talk with Mr. Covey. Welcome, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to conduct this interview. Thank you so much for having me, Gideka. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, I'm very excited to understand your journey because there has been some you know, twists and turns from what I've read. And so before we get into that, I'd like to know more about your typical day. What do you currently do and how does it run? Sure. Um, well, I guess these days, typical is a, a kind of interesting <laughs> word to put to it. Yes. But, <laughs> but for the most part, uh, since uh, Corona started and all the lockdown started, it was really important to me to, to get into a very tight schedule, a regular schedule. Um, so I start my days early. Um, I wake up at six. I have a cup of coffee, check my messages, um, and then do a bit of meditation try to you know, get into a mindful state of mind before the day starts, try to fit in a bit of exercise, a bit of yoga, and then normally start my day around you know, 7, 7.30ish. And I try to you know, just work for as long as I can until I need a break. I've, I've dabbled a little bit with the uh, Pomodoro method, if you're familiar with it. Um, I find that works really well for me to kind of have a timer and work in 45 minute bursts and then take a break. Um, but yeah, pretty much from, from seven to seven, um, I work on, you know, different things, whether they be research related or, uh, uh school related, um, as well as, you know, preparing my lesson plans and stuff. Wow. That's awesome. I definitely can see you keep yourself busy, but also active and you're kind of all over. So that's really great to see. And I can't wait to learn more about the specifics. So understanding that you are a college student and you know you probably have been a part of so many projects what is the most exciting project or research that you've worked on interesting um there are so many different things i think in general the most exciting project that i was a, a part of but a part of in a very minimal way was uh, there was an extremely energetic uh, astronomical transient you know something that went bang in the sky and uh, suddenly all of the astronomers around the world were trying to look at this object at different wavelengths. Um, and basically I had the role of kind of conglomerating all the information from different telescopes of different wavelengths together in one place so that everybody would be able to, uh, at least on our end, everybody would be able to understand the information as it came in. Uh, because obviously, you know, when you see things happening in the X-ray, they can give you certain bits of information and then you see other you know, physical uh, processes happening only in, you know, optical wavelengths. So that was really an honor to be a part of in, in, in my own small way. But, but generally, I, I really find a lot of passion in, in you know, any, any sudden hunt after a supernova. Yeah, of course. That sounds really fun. And so I, I, what are your long-term aspirations for your career? I mean, right now you're a student, but what are your long-term goals? What do you hope to achieve or pursue? I think that's a really good question. And uh, uh, a, a close friend of mine uh, who I work with at the Ramon Foundation a few months ago had said to me, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it, it's something that I think is always important to keep asking myself every so often to make sure that I'm on the right track and are doing things to actually uh, get me there. Uh, for the most part, I have a passion for astronomy and for space, and I want to keep working uh, at that on both sides, uh, meaning I'd I, I want to keep doing research and I want to keep, you know, investigating and studying the wonders of the universe um, because it, it's just fascinating to me. But also I want to make sure that I always share that with other people. And so that's why I want to, you know, keep working on science communication, keep creating collaborations of science communicators from around the world. Um, and, and yeah, just tackling it from both sides, you know, 
studying the universe and sharing it with others. I think that's amazing. I think, it, you know, more than just acquiring the knowledge, being able to provide that knowledge that you've gained to others, as well as collaborating, because I feel like the science community, the STEAM community in general is very collaborative. And that's how we get so much, you know, discoveries and so much things done. So I'm great that you're able to spread that. And so that leads me to my next question, actually, is could you tell us more about starting Fun Fact Science? I mean, what was your inspiration behind starting it? And it's been a huge success. I mean, I love your Twitter. I think it's amazing. So I'm sure a lot of others can relate to your social media. So how did you come up with it? I, I appreciate you uh, saying that, Kirika. Um, for me, I see it as being a, a minor success at best. I know that I still have a long way to go until I get up with, you know, the amazing names, you know, science communicators like Emily Calandrelli. Uh, I'm nowhere near that level. But uh, for me, Fun Fact Science was something that I just felt this drive to start right at the beginning of my degree where, you know, I was suddenly learning all of this new information. And I thought to myself, what better way to use this information, you know, besides the homeworks and the exams and all these other things where it's kind of like the information goes in one ear and comes out the other once you're done with the course, I thought, let's actually share this with other people. Let's make it accessible. Um, and also for me, it was beneficial because they say that, you know, if you can't explain a concept to a child, then you don't fully understand it. So I found that for me, it was a useful tool to actually solidify my understanding of certain topics by sharing it with others. Yeah, I think that's amazing. And did you ever feel like when you were starting it, there were certain obstacles or you felt like, you know, it was hard to come up with content or did you kind of align it with what you were learning in school? So uh, I was limited with what I was learning in school. And after a while, I kind of had to really start investing time to get different content from different areas of science, not just physics that I was focused on. Um, but I'm lucky to have a passion for space, which is one of the most marketable areas of science. You know, those wonderful pictures of nebulae and galaxies that just really lend themselves to inspiring people. Um, but it definitely was a challenge that I, I had to adapt at a certain point because I was investing a huge amount of time every day. Um, I think I didn't miss a day for something like two years every day publishing another fun fact a lot of the time on topics that I didn't really know a lot about. So I had to do a lot of research. And so I've kind of adapted now into turning it more into a platform for a uh, helping promote other people's content and giving um, up and coming science communicators a platform for themselves, but also sharing my own content that's, you know, maybe less technical and, and more accessible things like, uh, you know, memes that are related to science where people can have a chuckle and then kind of pause and say, well, hold on. I've just learned something new. Like you tricked me into learning something. <laughs> yeah, I know those are the best. I love going through those. And you know, just looking at the pictures behind you, they are so pretty. I think that's literally what intrigues younger students, younger kids into space. I think seeing the beautiful astrophotography and the cool things that you know we don't know about the unknown aspect of space is just so exciting for all of us. And uh, definitely the memes. Uh, a lot of young students can get really engaged with them, and they're fun to like actually look at because you learn something, but you also have a joke out of it um, and if you don't understand it you're curious to actually learn about it because then you'll understand the joke so I definitely think your um, you know method of reaching out to the audience is very uh, impactful so yeah I'm really glad for fun fact science so I also mentioned how earlier I was saying how you changed your track in your career so you originally wanted to go to uh, go into law and then you changed into you know going into science after high school when you were in college so you know how did you how did that change happen? Um, as I think I told you when we first spoke, it's a long story. Um, and but, if we but, have time. So. <laughs> um, okay, so <clears throat> I, I, I grew up in Australia. Um, and from the age of 14, growing up in Australia, I was kind of directed to, I, I, I'm not sure where it started. I guess I just kind of got attached to this idea of, you know, becoming a lawyer. I felt like it's something that my natural skill set would lend to. And it was generally acceptable that you go into the last couple of years of high school in Australia, knowing already what you want to do when you graduate. Um, something that in hindsight, I think is a really poor method of, of career choice. Um, because, you know, generally people need some time after they finish high school, they need a couple of years to get to know the world and experience new things, you know, and try out different areas of, of life before they decide, okay, this is what I'm going to spend the next 40 years of my life doing. So uh, I, I come from a, a Jewish family. A lot of Jewish children actually come to Israel for the year after they finish high school to volunteer. 
and to you know uh, kind of get familiar with the heritage. So that's something that I did after I finished high school and I fell in love with the place. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna you know, move here. Um, part of moving here at the age of 18 is uh, doing a mandatory military service with uh, which Israelis uh, from the age of 18 have to do uh, between two to three years. And it was in that process, you know, as I was starting, I thought, okay, I'll do my few years. And after I get out, I'll uh, continue with my plans to become a lawyer. And then uh, in the middle of my service, I had to move out of, uh, out of the position I was in because I had a back injury. And so I found myself looking for, you know, different roles that I could do that I would be able to continue, uh, you know, continue my, my, my military career for those few years. And I ended up in a role I had never considered um, in uh, electro optics, where basically I was sent out for a, uh, uh, a several month course to learn how night vision scopes work, to learn how um, you know different optical tools that are used in the infantry work, and and how to kind of maintain them on a very basic level. And I actually remember sitting there in one of the uh, one of the lessons of this optics course, where I was thinking why did I stop doing science? Like, at, at, at what point did I lose my passion for it? <laughs> um, and so I, uh, I returned to my unit afterwards in that new role. And, um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't the happiest of times because, you know, I had moved with these certain aspirations and dreams and goals. And uh, I found myself a lot of the time uh, sitting out, you know, the base was in the middle of the nowhere, sitting out with these different optical devices that we had, looking up at the stars. And the technology that a lot of the devices work on is based on amplifying starlight. So it basically takes light, uh, it takes photons from the optical uh, spectrum or the optical part of the spectrum, as well as infrared photons, and it converts into electronic signals. And then from that, it converts them back into visible photons at the other end. Um, and, and, it, and it just multiplies. You know, if you look up with your eyes and you see thousands of stars, you would see, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands with with these really cool uh, devices. And so between that and having these long drives to get to the base where I started watching Doctor Who for the first time, <laughs> I started listening to Star Talk, um, and all these things kind of just kind of came together um, and led me to this realization that, you know, space motivated me to such an extent that it was just inspiring. It was the only thing it was the only thing that I felt like I could justify spending the rest of my life working on. Um, yeah, so I came out of the army after two and a half years. I had to do a whole preparatory course in, in math just to you know, get up to the level that I need for university because in high school up to the, towards the end, I had taken only humanities courses. Um, my high school had allowed me to make that choice because I was planning to study law. I wouldn't need science, I wouldn't need math. Um, and that's something, by the way, that I think is a mistake. I think that um, there should be some basic level of math that, that kids should do in high school just to leave their options open, uh, besides you know, the fact that I think it's important. So yeah, there were quite a few twists and turns along the way. And then I ended up you know, basically building up my math to the level that it needed to be and uh, started my degree in physics. And now I'm a few, few months away from finishing that. Wow, congratulations. I mean, that's a great journey. Thank you for sharing that. First, I'd just like to say, um, I'm really glad that you were able to have that experience where you're able to discover your true love for science, even if you were deterred on a different path. And I, I think a lot of students at a young age love science, love space, but as they grow up, they feel like they have a sense of responsibility to get like a, a job that maybe they don't like because they think it needs to be more responsible and grown up to actually like live or whatever. And I feel like, you know, people start losing, um, you know, focus on, you know, what space really is and what's behind it. It's not just something that, you know, you can look up and watch TV and, you know, learn about all these cool discoveries. It's, it's actually something where you can do something. And so I'm glad that you were able to have that opportunity to explore. And I'm curious, did you not ever think of going into space policy because uh, you were interested in law and space? Was that a career choice you never thought of? I think that's something that's crossed my mind and I'm not sure if you ever have that experience of noticing suddenly that you're in a Facebook group that you don't remember when you had followed that group or joined <laughs> that group. So yeah. there, are, there are a few groups actually on space policy and space law like that, um, that every so often pop up in my feed and remind me that I, that did indeed cross my mind at, at one stage. Um, I think that that's something that's more left up to people 
uh, with a legal background, people who are familiar with the treaties around um, you know, settlement on the moon and things like that, obviously under the, um, you know, the advice that they can get from people uh, with backgrounds in you know, physics and, and engineering. Yeah, yeah, I definitely understand that. And I, your earlier point, you were saying how students, like they're limited by um, choices because you did, you took only humanities. And I was actually talking with another professor and she was saying how uh, in high school, she took, you know, all her right required courses. And then she went into college thinking she was going to biomedical engineering. And then she had to suddenly shift into just engineering. And when she had to do that, uh, she went to, she actually had to go to a different country when she was pursuing her engineering in graduate school. And when she did, she realized that the education system in the US versus different countries was actually very different. So like US, you can go into college with an undeclared major uh, and still kind of have that chance to explore. Whereas in other countries, like she was from Egypt, they weren't able to have this undeclared major or, you know, by the age of 15, by the time you get out of high school and you're going to college, they expect you to have an idea of what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And that's the college you're going to go to, the type of college you're going to go to, and you're kind of restricted. Did you ever feel restricted in your path or before, you know, going to Israel, like you kind of were stuck, like you didn't have a chance to explore, or did you feel like you were, you know, you had that opportunity to explore different subject areas? I think, uh, I think I was pretty, I didn't feel restricted by, you know, my family or anything like that. I, I just felt very overconfident in what I thought I wanted um, because I hadn't really experienced anything else. And, and even, you know, some of the other passions that I had back then, which were related to uh, film, um, I thought, okay, so I could do, you know, a double degree in arts and law and the art side of things would, you know, have something like film and communication or media and communication involved in it. Um, and, and I think just science was something, there's, there's a much more uh, clear split between sciences and the humanities where, where there isn't really a lot of things that can cross over between them. I mean, I, I think I'm definitely a little bit less afraid of writing up reports and, and papers and you know the, the literary side of things than some of my other colleagues might be. Um, but no, for the most part, you're, I, I guess I was just never really exposed to it uh, mm -hmm. at that level. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I definitely think exposure is key to understand your true discovery and, you know, through different efforts, whether it be, you know, social media like you've been using and trying to reach out to different target audiences, especially younger students who are trying to explore what they like. It's really important. And, um, you know, I'm curious because you got into space sciences actually after high school before going to college. So was starting to go into space sciences after high school really serve as an obstacle for you to pursue your dreams? Or was the ride actually surprisingly easy and smooth for you? I mean, I know you had to take a few. And by easy and smooth, I mean, relatively, I know it's not, nothing's ever easy. Uh, I know you said you did have to take a few math courses, but were there like huge obstacles for you when you're trying to shift majors? Well, uh, first of all, just as an aside that I don't think I mentioned, uh, doing my degree here in Israel, um, I was, I've done the entire degree in Hebrew, um, which is, you know, I knew a few words or phrases here and there growing up, you know, in a Jewish family, but I didn't, I didn't speak Hebrew, uh, nowhere near fluently. So that was one huge obstacle, actually having to do the degree in a, in a foreign language. Um, and then besides that, yeah, the math, I, I keep going back to it because I honestly sat down, I discovered Khan Academy just before I started that preparatory program. And, and I swear, I literally went to the lowest level of math, which was third grade math, and just worked my way up from there. And I continued using Khan Academy as, a, as an aid throughout the preparatory program and even throughout the first couple of years of my degree, because it's actually quite extensive, the material that's there. Um, so, so that was definitely an obstacle. But I think I think having the passion, there, there can be obstacles even for people who do have a strong math background, especially in something like physics, which can be very, very rigorous um, academically. But I think having the passion behind it is really important. And I think that even if, you know, for, for people who might be watching this and thinking, oh, I, I'm really passionate about space or I'm really passionate about, uh, you know, uh, biomedicine, like you suggested, but I'm not sure if I have the skill set. The skill set does come, and and if you don't have a passion to back it up, you're not going to have the motivation to you know keep working on a yeah. on a homework assignment late at night or studying cramming for an exam. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree that passion. I mean, every person I've interviewed, the common 
thing that everyone says is passion. And it really, I can see the passion of every single person I interview because you, you're not just, you know, trying to go after a career goal or get into a certain job, but I can see that you're all trying to give back to, you know, the other students who were in your position or, or who are in your position, and you're trying to help your community grow along with you. And so I'm really glad that you're able to do this and give back as well as grow as an individual. Um, it's really inspiring to see that and it wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't an obstacle. You took it as a challenge to improve yourself and use free resources. Like Khan Academy is amazing. I use it all the time to study. I, it helps me in all my subjects. So I know, you know, just always exploring and just having that drive is really important. No, definitely. And if, if I can just say like having other science communicators who I could look up to throughout the process, people who, you know, not, not only expose me to all this amazing content, but who are actually willing to talk about their struggles along the way. Um, I think that's made a huge difference where I can, you know, go onto social media and see these uh, these incredible science communicators saying, "Hey, you know, this was hard for me as well. Um, not everything is is you know all roses, and, and not everything is easy along the way. And so it's nice to know that you're not the only one struggling." Yeah, definitely. I've not interviewed one person so far who said their path was very straightforward. I mean, they're very successful people, but they've gone through so much. I feel like every individual, when we like read on the news, we see such amazing um, social media influencers, whatever industry, space or not. I feel like if we're always like, oh, they're so lucky. They, you know, they've gotten to such a high position with great job and great research opportunities. And they're so amazing. I, you know, I wish I could be like them. And we just assume it's like not possible and we think their ride was easy but in reality if you like hear their story or read journals about them it's like they went through so much um maybe even worse obstacles than we have and they were able to grow because they had that drive and passion so definitely it's not an easy ride but seeing live examples which is exactly the reason i'm doing the youtube series is to highlight diverse space champions with diverse stories diverse obstacles because you know, just sharing my story or someone else's story, you know, one other person's is not going to reach out to diverse audience. So being able to highlight even one, you know, who's different is really important. So yeah, how are you, yeah. So how are you able to achieve so much, you know, as a student at a young age, like where do you get your inspiration and drive from apart from the fact that you love space so much? Like what is your, what is your drive? Um, firstly, I have an incredibly supportive wife. Um, who, you know, in, in every possible way, emotionally, um, you know, mentally, financially, like she is just always there for me and always incredibly supportive, uh, even though she doesn't come from a science background. That's, um, awesome. that's, that's, that's the really important part. And I think also just having a community, both of, you know, uh, close friends uh, here in Israel, but also friends within the science communicator community, um, who are always there for you, they're always there for you to you know, bounce ideas off, um, to talk to. And uh, like you were saying before, this whole idea of science communicators always looking to give back because they're so passionate. Um, the perfect example was this uh, conference that I think I mentioned to you when we first spoke, uh, the Ramon uh, SciComm conference yeah. um, that I arranged for Israel Space Week in January. And that was a conference that we organized completely voluntarily. I, you know, put in months of my time to organize it voluntarily with the help of the Ramon Foundation. Um, all the speakers came without being paid. Um, you know, there were no paid sponsors or anything like that. It was just science communicators helping science communicators share science and talk about, you know, their journeys and talk about what they think needs to be worked on in the world of academia. And even though there were a few uh, really amazing people, um, uh, Kirsten Banks, uh, Catherine Machen, and Lee Giat, who gave these kind of mini TED talks about, you know, what is the right, I don't, I don't want to say the right path, because every path is different, but, you know, key steps and things that they've found along their journey of how to, you know, um, get the most out of your career as a science communicator and what things to do and what's worked for them and kind of just sharing their story. So without knowing incredible people like that, there's, you know, no way I could have succeeded in any way. Yeah, direction is key. I, I found that, you know, both my parents are not from the space industry. So uh, they're, you know, more computer science and like economics background. So when I was like into space, it was obviously a different area and they weren't able to help me because they didn't have exposure. But the only way I was able to learn was through, you know, other people's stories, like you were saying. I think the way that younger people can grow is by looking at people who've already done the journey and, you know, seeing, you know, okay, so this is like what they did. What can I do that, you know, will also help me grow and 
you know, if you have a role model, obviously following them is, you know, something that can help you. So I definitely agree that having that support or that network and community, I love the Twitter space community. I think it is amazing and so inclusive. So I know that um, you can learn so much from mentors. Did you always imagine yourself and the position you are in today in terms of, um, I guess, like being more involved in social media and so, I mean, obviously your career changed, uh, not talking about career, but I guess you as a person, did you, did you have like, um, did you become different than what you thought you were going to be? I mean, to be completely blunt, I don't think that 18 year old me had a clue, uh, you know, of the person that I would, I would grow to be. Um, I mean, uh, my wife, who I met uh, less than a week after moving to Israel, uh, we both happened to move here around the same time. Um, I mean, she's seen the changes in me, you know, uh, uh, good friends that I've had who have known me throughout the process have seen that I've, I've developed into a, I would say, vastly different person. They would probably agree. I think that one of the amazing things about space, I know that the question wasn't about space, but it's, it's related. Um, yeah, of course. There's this, there's this idea called the uh, Copernican principle, uh, which is you know, basically this idea that um, the Earth's position in the solar system isn't special. You know, the, <laughs> the uh, sun doesn't revolve around the Earth, not the whole universe doesn't revolve around the Earth or anything like that. But the Earth's position in our solar system isn't unique and our solar system's position in the galaxy isn't unique and our galaxy's position in the local galactic neighborhood isn't unique and so on and so forth. And for, for some people, this can be incredibly daunting. Uh, thinking of all these infinities in space, it, it can be a bit, it yeah. can be a bit weird, a bit, bit heavy. But I think, uh, I think for me, one of the things that definitely changed me the most as a person was having this realization um, of you know looking out, not not up, looking out at the stars, and realizing that when you take this kind of cosmic perspective, like uh, Carl Sagan used to call it, you realize that you can't afford to get worked up over little things like, you know, people being so violently opposed to one another because they have a difference of opinion or, or political ideology or religious affiliation or my country is better than your country. At a certain point, we all have to realize that we're on this floating ball of dirt together <laughs> as a yeah, one planet. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important to realize. I, I, I think, I, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that, like, if, if I can, you know, help one person realize that every day, like, I feel like I'm definitely getting somewhere, even if I don't have the most likes or the biggest impact, or if I'm not, you know, signing book deals or Netflix deals, the fact that I know that, you know, one person has, has been able to get that perspective and it's had a positive effect on their lives, I think is, you know, me feeling a sense of validation and, you know, it's worth doing what I do. I 100% agree with that statement. I mean, when I do any webinar or workshop, I don't even care about like, okay, you know, I reach out to like a million students. Like I don't have goals like that. I mean, of course I want to reach out to the broadest audience I can, but you know, even if I'm doing like a smallest webinar with like five or 10 students, I know that I'm going to give my 100%, whether it be with those 10 students or, you know, 5,000 students, because I know, because even if I impact one or two students, it makes, you know, me feel like my work is helpful because I'm just trying to impact students who are, who are like me and, you know, help them get a little bit of clarity that I was able to get because of, you know, my lucky mentors that I've had, and maybe they don't have it. So even just being a mentor to one or two people or providing them guidance or, you know, helping them discover their passion is like a big deal. So I definitely agree with what you were saying about that. And, you know, we're so small compared to the huge world. I remember in like, I think it was first or second grade, we were reading a book or watching this small video. It was like a two minute clip and it showed like, uh, it was in a book. It, was, it showed a person and it zoomed out of that person. And the person was like in a book and it like a, it was like the person was in a ship, which was on like an ocean, which was on, it was, which was in a book of another person reading. And it was like this, it like zoomed out into like this whole world. And it makes us feel so tiny. Um, of course, even time we, we as individuals can still make a huge difference, even if we're so small, but understanding that perspective of, you know, there's so much out there is, you know, very daunting, like you were saying. So I think that was really cool. So my next question for you is what was key to becoming knowledgeable about the industry you were in? Um, you know, getting into space, obviously you were in the 
military, so you learned a lot there. Were there any other internships, mentorship programs, maybe research experiences that really helped you kind of get more knowledgeable about the space industry? Um, yeah, definitely. There are a lot, like I was saying before, a lot of incredible people who have helped me along the way. Um, I think one of those more than anyone else is uh, um, my uh, academic uh, advisor slash mentor. He's basically the head of the head of the research team that I uh, work on, uh, Dr. Asaf Khoresh. And when I was a second year student, um, I had actually ended up accidentally on a astrophysics retreat that was for students who were meant to be finishing their degree. Um, so I was like the, the young one out. Um, and the idea was to familiarize the students with uh, astrophysics and there were lectures and stargazing and all these things. And we were on the way back from, from a hike somewhere as part of this program. And I, I just asked him flat out, I said, like, I would love to come, uh, you know, be a part of your team in any way, even if it's bringing coffee to people, just, just anything to, you know, kind of, I feel like what I was lacking at that time was a feeling that I was doing something towards this space related goal rather than just the the math courses and the physics courses I needed to feel like I had at least you know one foot uh in in you know the, that next step forward and he was uh he's just you know absolutely changed my life um you know I started going to the uh the weekly research meetings of the of the department getting involved getting to know people familiarizing myself with the research material understanding also the lexicon and the way that physicists, you know, not just physics professors, but actual physicists who are actively doing research talk about these topics. Um, and, and it's just been, you know, incredibly helpful. Um, yeah, and like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am today without his help. So yeah. I think Thanks everyone can say that about a teacher or a mentor. I think it was a tweet of yours who actually, you know, someone was saying business or education is like a business. I think it was your tweet that said, you know, it's not, it's like mentorship. I had great experiences and I, you know, completely agree, which every person has like at least a teacher, if not multiple, who really shaped their education experience, not only in terms of academics, but their character, uh, their passion. I feel like, you know, students are in that stage where they're growing and teachers are a huge role with what subjects they like. Um, you know, what activities they choose to pursue. Like I wouldn't have gone to space if it wasn't for my middle school tech ed teacher. So I can completely agree with that statement. Um, that mentors for, for sure. Sorry, I, it's just, it's funny that you mentioned that tweet because I was thinking about that a moment ago when you asked the previous question um, because that tweet was in response to, you know, people having certain uh, gripes against academic institutions. And, and a lot of the times universities do often act more as a business than as an you know, a, a pedagogical institution. Um, and that's a whole other issue that I mean, I'm not here to complain about universities, but what you're right, what I did say in that tweet is that it's important to have those few people who really do care and really have a passion uh, for education uh, above all else. And they're actually, you know, passionate about the science rather than just the administrative side of things. Um, but, but also on that note, regarding what you were saying about having a mentor like that in high school, you know, forget, people who once they already made it to college, they've already had to make certain life decisions. Um, so so the one, this program that I teach in as part of the Ramon Foundation uh, called the Space Lab program is exactly that. It's a, it's a two year project-based learning program where basically each project uh, or each mission as they like to call it is teaching a different skill and using space as an inspirational tool for that. Um, and then the last mission where you use all the skills, you know, the skills of learning how to research things yourself and learning how to work in a team and learning how to, you know, present an idea uh, with, you know, a presentation and a talk. So all these things come to a head in the last mission where the students actually prepare an experiment to get sent up the uh, ISS to the International Space Station. Um, and, and I've always said this to, you know, the other mentors who work with me in this program and, and teachers who work with the program as well. But the goal isn't to turn every single person there into an astrophysicist, yeah. although that would definitely make me happy. The goal <laughs> is to the goal is to use space as an inspirational tool to show these kids that they can do um, a lot more than they think they're capable of, to kind of take a step out of the academic framework that they're used to of exams and homework and say, okay, let's learn through projects and let's see how far we can go. Yeah, I'm a huge uh, advocate for 
PBL learnings or project-based learning, I think that helps me learn so much better than just taking notes sitting in a classroom. Um, the concept of actually doing and experimenting and learn to trial and error has been, I mean, I did it uh, for my science classes all the time. And I think it's an amazing way of learning. And so moving towards like your excitements and your more interest in your space industry is what excites you and what makes you nervous about the future of the space industry? I'm really curious to see what you have to say about this. Oh, um, there's so much. I mean, what excites me is more global collaboration. Um, you know, you can look at things like the, the the discovery of the gravitational wave events that are part of these huge collaborations where, you know, it used to be that you'd have a scientific paper written by, you know, uh, Jane Smith and, and Joe Black and, you know, whatever, a handful of people. And then it became, you know, person A et al. And now you basically have a, a list of co-authors that's, you know, a thousand people long in things like the gravitational <laughs> wave experiment, which is wonderful. You know, yeah, science yeah. isn't just about credit, although credit where credit's due, of course, a lot of people are working incredibly hard for, for these things to actually happen. But to be seeing collaborations happening, uh, you know, between teams across different countries, and you'll have some event go off where you'll have, you know, a gravity wave, a gravitational wave detection, and then you have the radio astronomers like my team, you know, jumping on it to see if they can detect a signal. And at the same time, you have the space telescopes and gamma ray, uh, gamma ray telescopes and X-ray telescopes immediately looking to that same area. And it's kind of like the whole world of astronomy just turns its sights to one small location on the sky. That will never not excite me. Um, on the on the same, uh, you know, in the same breath, in terms of what makes me nervous on a, on a professional level, um, I think that I think that people really need to be conscious of how to use space in a way that is both environmentally friendly and also efficient and, and to make space, you know, not this exclusive thing for people who can afford it, but to find a way to make space um, kind of like the frontier for all of mankind, not just for a few, um, you know, to avoid overpopulating low earth orbit with satellites uh, that could lead to all sorts of uh, unfortunate situations, uh, you know, of over polluting low earth orbit. Um, and on a personal level, I'm just, you know, nervous to continue academically. I have this uh, incredible opportunity uh, for grad school in Australia starting next year, and I'm both nervous but really looking forward to it. Yeah, I know you're going to do amazing wherever you are uh, with the program. But anyway, good luck with that part. Um, but yeah, I definitely Thank agree so with what you were saying about the excitement. Collaboration is really key globally, uh, or even in your community. I think working is really important. Working together is really important, um, as well as what ner makes you nervous. I think you know we have been so far very responsible with the technology we've been sending up there and how we've been trying to use the budget in order to improve here like life on earth whether it be through biomedicine which is what i'm interested in or whether it be through other aspects like you know um using space technology and like you know using satellites in order to have a gps i know here on earth we take for granted the amazing apps we have on our phone but i know the gps is one of the most useful apps at least for me uh, as a new driver and i <laughs> will be thankful for that forever so i definitely agree that um you know there's a lot to be excited about but being responsible with our technology and our innovations is um, key always and to kind of wrap up the interview, because we've heard a lot about your inspiring journey, whether it be from changing the law to, you know, science background and, you know, your journey into social media and influencing the younger generations to pursue their passion of space. I'm sure you've learned a lot so far and you still have a long way to go. But what advice do you have for young people regarding their pursuit of a passion in the STEM field or space industry, something that you wish you knew when you were in like high school or maybe even middle school? I think uh, uh, first and foremost, um, don't cut yourself off from any options. Don't be, you know, so certain that you say, okay, I can just ignore an entire field. You know, I, like I said before, I never would have guessed that I would end up in the sciences. And I, even when I started physics, I had no idea that computer science, the programming would be such a huge part, uh, you know, because besides reading a lot, um, a large part of, of the work that I do uh, involves coding. Um, so I would say that as, as one, you know, to, to not close yourself off to, to any fields and to always be willing to learn more. Uh, but two, to, to be able to uh, feel comfortable reaching out to people. Um, all of the scientists that I know and all the science communicators I know especially um, are always willing to answer questions. So if you 
want to learn more about a field because you don't want to close yourself off to it or you want to actually learn from somebody who's been through the experience what you know what the different paths are um you know what you should do to prepare and to kind of get a, a bit of an insight from people who are actually you know living in these fields and working in these fields that you're interested in um, just reach out to them just you know send them an email obviously don't you know spam them with email after email day after day um <laughs> But, but for the most part, you know, if you, if you send them an email, if you don't hear from them for, you know, a week or two, send them another email. Uh, for, for the most part, you know, these are good people who just want to, you know, to, to learn and to educate and to make the world a better place. Um, and they'll, you know, always be willing to take the time to, 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 to help you out. Yeah, I def that is some that is definitely amazing advice. I definitely agree with the part of networking um, and never giving up. I think always trying to make sure you're broadened with your you know views and aspects, and you're not restricting yourself over like, oh, I'm only going to go into this specific path. Like you have a long way to go, whether it be undergrad studies, graduate studies, and then your PhD, which is you know if you choose to pursue it, of course. But you're always like going in like a pyramid level, and you're if you start very narrow and you're not very open to other things, you might not find the exact area of study that really excites you and like someone says you know get butterflies in your stomach um and so i definitely agree with that and also networking is so key i you know throughout this process meeting you and many other space individuals was only possible through you know using social media and networking and not being afraid to reach out i can literally vouch for that i've met some amazing mentors like yourself and it really your support your advice that you give me um really allows me to improve ignited thinkers as well as reach out to more audiences so um i definitely agree with the networking part whether it be because you're starting something or you want to pursue a different track and you want some research opportunities or just advice because you're kind of lost like I really want to do this but you don't know how to do it there are people who have done what you want to do so um, definitely you know reaching out and working with others is very key so I want to thank you so much Mr. Covey for you know doing this interview with us I truly enjoyed our conversation um, but I do want to respect your time I could go all day talking with you about your work and you know, the amazing um, projects that you're working on and I wish you luck for your future studies. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.